fairly smoothly, and I've got to give credit where credit's due. It's right there. <laughs> Dan does all the uh, enrollments. I mean, she takes the thing, and she she's definitely a major part of this operation. So I just want to make sure she appreciates. She heard that from all of us. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Good. Thanks, Greg. I hope you all had a good night. Yesterday was just a taste. You've still got quite a lot to do. So if you felt that you were information out and you can't take any more, you're welcome to leave. <laughs> <laughs> There's lots more to come and it ties it all together. So today we're going to be looking at plants in particular and how we influence the plants by changing the soil, getting the plants we want and getting the performance we need in livestock, which will be maybe later today or early tomorrow morning. Depending on questions as to how fast we can go, or sorry, fast we can go. So we have understood that the, we have the capability of changing the fungal bacteria relationship in the soil. And remember, what grows on the soil is a mirror image of what is in the soil. So through livestock density and time, we change the carbon content in and on the soil, which affects the life in the soil, which has a direct impact on that fungal bacterial relationship. And as I said yesterday, this is all about learning. So it is hopefully sustainable because you are your own teacher and I'm just giving you pointers as what to do in terms of learning what your property is capable of. And you do a small infusion zone so that if you make a mistake or the result is not what you expected, it hasn't cost you much and you haven't lost too much money. Sadly, it is all about the money. If you don't make money, you won't stay on the property. Now, it's all very well conventional thinking, say, don't worry, there'll always be farmers. It's not farmers or ranchers that we're worried about or I'm worried about. I'm worried about the knowledge that people have of that particular piece of land. Because here I'm trying to teach you what that land can do for you as an occupier of that land. But if you then lose the land and have to go and get a job in town, that knowledge is gone and the next occupier will take at least five to ten years to learn about the property. So it's about the money. Any questions that you'd like to start with today before we go on to these plants? Everybody happy? Maybe punch drunk? But bear with me, we'll get through it. No questions. Good. So we'll move on. And in terms of understanding the whole, we know, or I've said to you that I could never have accumulated this knowledge and it was only from the age of 40 that I was taking notice of what was happening in and on the soil. I couldn't have done it without holistic management. But again, I will repeat to you, I nearly went broke practicing holistic management because it's all about saving the world. And I believe I cannot save the world as I've already said unless I save you guys on the land, making a reasonable living and return on your investment in time and labor and capital investment in the farm and the livestock that you are running. And people remember farm or ranch or ranch or whatever you call it is the same thing. So we move on and we understand that we've been there, we've talked about the holistic management. And the number of people that have never moved out of that circle because of conventional thinking, you are required to get information from institutions and people who do not understand your holistic goal. And we in holistic management have our three-part goal, quality of life, forms of production, and future resource space. 
we put the whole under management in a file so we know where to find it when the opportunity arises we can exercise that opportunity and buy the piece of land the ecosystems water cycle mineral cycle energy flow and community dynamics are the filter to that decision leading towards the holistic goal to make sure that every decision you make is environmentally sound so it's got to be environmentally socially and economically sound otherwise you will go down we've got the tools that work the soil because humans per se cannot work the soil so the two new tools the option of grazing and animal impact and otherwise the tools in the tool bag are exactly the same as conventional thinking but the bunny huggers and bill gates etc believe that these animals are destroying the world we need to be more vocal about what we believe and make sure that people understand you cannot save the world unless the soil is fixed and only animals can fix the soil with your help obviously managing those animals so we have the seven testing guidelines and please the first one which is not in the book is common sense and if common sense tells you don't do this decision please scrap it and don't even investigate it otherwise you investigate it you test the test using the testing guidelines where it fails is where you monitor and in monitoring you push it and make sure that the outcome of that decision is something that is positive in terms of where you want to go and again we've got planning procedures there are four of them and they are different from conventional so that difference is in financial planning the questions you ask yourself and I'll say here people that it's probably better to get the holistic management workbook than to try and read the textbook. The textbook has Google D Goop, you've got to learn the language before you can understand what they're trying to tell you. And the workbook puts it in a language that you might enjoy. So we have financial planning, we've got land planning biological monitoring and the most important the grazing planning so today we're going to be talking about recovery periods and how we decide the recovery periods of the plants that we have so remember you plan for what you want and you work with what you have and they all have different recovery periods because diversity creates stability and we have all these different plants in our spores they've all got different recovery periods and I told you yesterday anything that is stressed breeds humans go to war and they <coughs> breed grass is stressed and they push up seeds so the recovery period becomes shorter and shorter because they breed quicker and quicker because that's the way they can sustain that species going into the future the more you fix the soil, carbon in and around the soil, soil life, etc. We spoke about that yesterday. Those plants will start relaxing. They'll grow taller. The leaves will be broader. The same species that you started with. And gradually over time, you get a species change because you've changed the fungal bacterial relationship in the soil and the plants that you thought you would never see in your life will come to the fore and they will capture more sunlight and you will make money remembering that energy is money, money is energy, time is money and water is money. So we keep that at the back of our mind. That's why I've got to say it to you so often because I hope you dreamed last night about energy is money and swore that yeah and if he ever says that again I will shout at him. <laughs> but it's that that will keep you on the land. So we then monitor and make sure we understand what is happening, we observe and we keep a notebook because I promise you people that what you learn today within two weeks you've forgotten it. And nature is not going to throw you that curved ball until two years, three years down the line and you will make the same mistake if you do not put it down. 
There is plenty of media, be it cell phones, be it computers, whatever, or notebooks. A notebook tends to get lost or get wet in the rain, and, you know, you lose the thing. So put it in a couple of places, and preferably go back and look at it. <laughs> Understand and learn. Because the more you internalize your mistakes and understand from them, and you need to make mistakes because they hurt you financially. And some of you have already heard me say that the F in father stands for fool. Because most fathers are fools in terms of their siblings or children. But fortunately it does change as they learn and find that what they were trying to do didn't actually work and you were right in the first place. I know because I've been there. So we make that decision leading towards the holistic goal, that three-part goal, and we understand now what to do. So we look at the growth curve of grass, grass. So, is that pointing? Yeah. That bracket, so we look here, bulk is going up the vertical axis, time on the horizontal axis. And if we do something here, that short bit, it's, that's the amount of yield we're going to get. So the bulk is very small. But as that time goes, we here, if we compare that with that, how much more are we going to gain by grazing that? And if you interpret what I was talking about yesterday, <coughs> excuse me, that equates to one bite off most plants. And funny enough, that is exactly what animals do. If you watch animals when they come into a new paddock, they'll take one bite, and we'll go through that to understand it, off the top of the grass. <coughs> so there are people who cannot see the bell curve and understand the implication of time and yield, We'll move on and we'll quantify it in weight. But I hope you're educated enough to talk about kgs <laughs> and per hectare. 2.2 acres in a, I beg your pardon, 2.2 pounds to a kilogram and 2.47 acres to the hectare. But I'm going to be talking about hectares and, and kilograms. So we here at the bottom, so we're cutting at 10 days, we're going to yield this 6, 9, 8 kilograms per hectare of grass. We leave at 20 days, we've now gone to 2,900 kilograms per hectare. That is huge, people. But it's not as big as the next one. 30 days, 6, 9, 8, 0. Six tons, six thousand kgs, seven thousand kgs, and you talk about holding more livestock per hectare per acre, and now you can see visually why what I was talking about yesterday is a possibility. Because if you are a person who's stuck in science, and really science is about observation. This is what somebody has worked out and proven that that is the case. Then we might like to believe it. Any questions on that? Yes, sir. I'll bite. So you're saying the difference between 20 days and 30 days is, is that much smoother <coughs> growth in the grass? Yes. So if you go out and you graze your paddock, and now all of a sudden you've decided to bring them into the working pens, and you go through that paddock again to get to the working pens and then two months down the road you want to go to the working pens again and you go through the same paddock whoopsie i've had a drought i haven't had any rain and i've got no more grass why because that grass there grass <coughs> if it has been taken off so many times before it has recovered will not grow it will stop growing it's got to take a breath before it can actually then start photosynthesizing. I mean, you will lose out in terms of the amount of food. I will tell you later, and I don't want to tell you now, 
but I'll mention it now, is that you are actually just harvesting the energy. You'll be more accurate when you get in a drought if you can assess the energy in that paddock instead of volume because there's more energy there than there is volume. Okay, but we'll move on. So here we have a car and it happens to be Greg's car. So it's a special car. Right? <laughs> I was just about to say, it's a southpaw. <laughs> but funny enough, many cattle around the world act like southpaw. <laughs> Greg doesn't believe so. But anyway, I better, I better give him his commercial, otherwise he's really wasted his time for the whole thing. So. <laughs> it is a southpaw. So watch the southpaw, and it's quite interesting what she does because she grazes, and she happened to be as close as this table. That's why I got this photograph that was so clear. And she grazes, oh my goodness, she's loving it, and she grazes, and she has eaten that grass, or taken a bite off the top of that grass, lifted her head, and she chews, and chews, and chews, and swallows, but then overtime, she moves off. Now what has happened? Why does she not eat this grass? Because the nose of an animal can sense where the highest energy is. That's how she functions. She doesn't have to smell it, but it's a wave receptor of magnetic fields. And she knows where the best energy is. She'll go to the other side of the paddock and do exactly what she's done there. <coughs> And she will continue to do that until the best energy has been used up. And then maybe you should move her. But that's why we talk about stock density and time. Because if you put a few animals into a big paddock, the first thing those animals do is walk around the paddock and immediately you have lost in excess of 30% of your grazing because they're not going to eat that grass where they're trodden. So if you had watched those cattle yesterday, they came into the paddock, they were all excited, new energy, they all grazed for a bit, then all of a sudden, whoa, they slowed down. It was a small area, they walked around, they hadn't completed the energy, because if you'd watched, there's certain areas that they hadn't actually grazed, but they had walked in, and they don't want to eat it because it smells of cow. No animal eats on its own species. You know that you've gone into a paddock and you've seen this grass that is now bright green and it was because a cow dung there last time they grazed and it has grown tall. And this is the beginning of the reclamation of your soils because it is indicated with fertility and added carbon in the dung and resources to feed soil life and that is starting to move but if you've got bright green patches in your pasture your density is not high enough you are now grazing a mosaic and mosaic is some places are grazed other places are left and the ones that are grazed this grazing will be the ones that are grazed next grazing because the ones that weren't grazing are no longer in the vegetative stage that's how important it is so if you're going to use bush hog, you graze the cattle first and you bring the bush of hog in to level it off. If you are learning, it can, you can learn a lot with bush hogs, particularly with fescue, as how to manage the fescue to keep it in a vegetative stage so that the livestock can consume it and eat it at the right time. So we move on and for the purpose of this example, now, guys, I don't know where you come from. I know you all don't come from Missouri. But that's why I define for this example. Because you've got to do what you need to do in those areas where you live, which are going to be different. Different climate, different altitude, etc. is going to affect this. So for the purpose of this example, one herd of animals, 10 paddocks, 30 day recovery period. Did everybody have the recovery period? 30 days. It's not for everybody. 
So we move on, and there it is, those green stripes are a paddock. All right, I've got 10 paddocks, so we go along, and there the paddocks are. They've grown because it's in spring. Now, how to go from winter, non-growing season, to growing season, we'll talk about at length a bit later, but for the moment, I'm just simplifying things so that you get the idea of how to graze, what to do, and the effect it's going to have on your pocket. So there the paddocks are grown. They've had a 30-day recovery period from the beginning of the growing season. Because you were conventional, you grazed incorrectly, the roots are very short, and then the roots are. So a lot of those plants will be pulled out of the ground by roots and all, because they've got short roots. You go in and you graze it, and that's what happens. One bite off most plants are taken off the top. And what happens in the soil? There's a dieback in the soil or stuffing off of carbon, which puts carbon in the soil. So you've now got carbon on the soil. Your density is reasonable. We've trodden down a huge amount. And we've now given it a 30-day recovery period. So we go back into paddock number one, and there you've got 10 paddocks. But it's slightly different because you now, in effect, have double the food because of what you did in the first 30 days and this is the second 30 days so the equivalent of 20 paddocks now instead of 10 paddocks in terms of volume and you understood that from that graph that I started the lecture with that if you let grass grow tall and take one bite off you are going to have more the next grazing because of the way you graze and the roots go deeper and we come in and we graze the top and there's a dieback in the roots and so it goes. And we get to the third grazing. Now we're working with 30 paddocks or the volume of 30 paddocks because of the way we have managed the ground. We put the cattle in, there's a dieback in the soil, there's the roots and now we are well on the way to building carbon, fixing the soil. We've had the kinetic energy, symbiotic energy, the action of grazing in the soil, the plants are all excited, they're growing like crazy. You're capturing three times the energy. The photosynthesis has never stopped operating because you took one bite off the top of the plant. The plant never stopped. If you took four or five broad, I beg your pardon, mouthfuls off the top of the plant, it would stop. And it would take a week before it started again. And immediately you lost a week's food. So what has happened? Because of the density, I keep talking about density, how important the density is. Here we have put litter on the ground. You can see all there, the three grazings with a 30-day recovery period. But we've also got litter in the soil, and there it is between those red lines. Carbon on the soil, carbon in the soil. We've had the energy impact on the ground. Everything is hunkadori. People, I started to do this because nobody could understand and I came to the conclusion that with this accent of mine that you didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> so I put it in drawings for you. Does anybody not understand what I'm talking about? It is simple. Keep it simple. Don't complicate it. Anybody want questions? Based on the drawing, most of the carbon is from the roots, not from the plants. Most of the carbon is from the plants, not the roots. The carbon in the roots is incidental and it's small in terms of volume. And Christine Jones talks about liquid carbon, but I'm not even going to go there. Because it's another whole subject and we'll take a month to talk about it. Yes, sir. Man, sorry. I guess... Okay, so my question then is, if you've only taken that top bite each time, and then you come back, like the next growing season, is it it's already going to have all that really long root structure and be even healthier the next year? Correct. But and first of all, you've got the non-growing season. <laughs> so what have I done? I've built my bales on the ground. I don't buy a baler. 
don't send the money to town because the cattle will eat it. So it's a haystack effect. And if this is the last phase of the growing season, that is 180 days worth of food. I divided it into two because I'm wanting to use the one species of bacteria in the rumen so you use your whole property with the same bacteria which will keep the average condition of the cows or whatever sheep at a level that is better than you used to do where you put them in a paddock and you graze it till it's finished every five days as the grass deteriorates in nutrition as they select it'll go down 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 and it needs to use different bacteria and by the time you finish in 40 days time or 50 days time you're using bad bacteria not that they're bad but they're not working on good grass you move to the next paddock and they're not working on good grass and you lose those first 10 days of the better grass because the bacteria has got to change does everybody know what i'm talking about good hey you guys must have been to Africa and got educated. <laughs> Good. I'm pleased. And it makes a huge difference, guys, talking to you and seeing the faces, and I know you understood. So we go to a dairy farmer just to put into practice and show you what has actually happened in terms of what I've just spoken about. Now people at dairy farm or dairy cattle are no different from beef cattle. They've got the same bacteria in the rumen, so they are no different. It's just we humans have given them differences because with a dairy farm, you see the result tonight. So you've got to give them better nutrition because you are competing with your neighbor and you've got both boasting rights to say, oh, my cows produce so many liters per cow today. Whereas with beef cattle, you only know in 18 months time and then you've forgotten what you did anyway, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> so beef cattle traditionally have always eaten the leftovers instead of getting the right for food. Every animal deserves the best food. So there we go to this dairy farm, which is not far from me. Huge complexity in plants, complexity, a diverse plants. Diversity creates stability. It is under a center pivot. And there you have the animals early in the morning. They are let out of the dairy. But I want you to watch the body language of these animals. And I hope you can hear the noise. seen a dairy cow do that? Yeah. I don't believe you. <laughs> Most dairy cows walk, nodding their head, they're probably limping because they've eaten too much protein, full of flies, hollow on the left hand side, and they can't even take steps, let alone run like that. This dairy farmer, I supply him with free choice minerals, and each time, I've done it for six years, and each time I see him make a delivery, I tell him if he moved his cattle more often, they'd do better. And after six years, he said, I will try it. I want to believe you. So I said, same area that you normally use for the cattle for a day, divide it into four, move them four times a day, and that was the result of the cattle. But the tank in the dairy produced a more milk. So now he's interested. So he comes to me and he says, I know you've only told me a part of the story. Tell me the rest. So I said, well, if you move them 12 times a day, you'll get a better reaction. Oh, he says, that's a bit difficult. But anyway, he employed somebody else and he moved the same herd. These are a thousand cows in that dairy. And he moved them differently. So here it is. 
And if you could hear his voice, he'd be saying to you, the man moving the cattle phoned me and told me to come and have a look. And I thought, oh dear, disaster. Cattle have died or something's gone wrong because this chap never phones me. So he goes down there and there the cattle are. It was on the third graze, moving 12 times a day on the same area that he used to give his cattle for the whole day. And at half past 10, when they tried to move the cattle, the cows were lying down and wouldn't get up. The cattle were so full of nutritious grass, they couldn't consume another blade. And the same area that he'd used previously for his sows and cattle. So he sends me, send me the video, and you can see the change. So the cattle are lying down in the back there, and they won't get up, and they won't move to the new paddock. Here he is. So there he is saying only half the cows eventually moved on to the fresh prank. But the old paddock, they'd only taken out 20%. So he says to me, what do I do? And I said, well, it's quite simple. You've got to go and get another thousand cows. <laughs> <laughs> he said, but I don't want another thousand cows. I don't want to build another dairy. <coughs> But eventually he's come to an agreement with a youngster who has been financed, has bought a thousand cars, and they are now running on the same property, mm. two thousand cars, and milking it. Yes, sir. Uh, if you couldn't grow cattle size, would you, would you shrink the paddock? Is that the other way? You could shrink the paddock, you could hire out to somebody else, you could let it go, whatever. Whatever fits your holistic goal. Whatever makes you happy. But I've tried to show you this just to show what actually happens. Now I know if I didn't show you these photographs, you'd walk out of here and he says, ah, that's the end. That's Africa. It doesn't happen here, it can't happen here. I'm telling you, it doesn't matter where you are. You can make it happen if you do it properly. So you can see here is the fence line. Where are we here? There. Can you see the fence there? Yeah. The so there's fence. the old paddock. And they've probably taken out 20% one bite off plants. <coughs> they haven't even bothered to move. Here they are moving across to the new. And there's still cattle way back there in the old paddock. They don't want to move. Yes, sir. So when you went to 12, 12 times a day, what was the time wait before they were back in that one? 30 days. Mm -hmm. Recovery period, yeah. maybe 30 days. <coughs> Guys, any questions? I'm happy to try and answer yes, sir. What about the herd density now? It was pretty high. You can imagine a thousand cattle, and if you gave them a paddock, they could graze for a day, and they were satisfied in terms of filling the rumen, and you divide, you push them into a twelfth of the area, it's pretty tight. Yeah. But what I'm trying to get across to you is you can do that once in a while and you will continue for some time to get the benefit because you can see what it did and you'll be encouraged to tighten them maybe half as much or whatever you want to fit your holistic goal and quality of life. So you don't have to do that the whole time. Yes, sir. All right. You have cattle, you have a pasture, you're grazing your pasture. You're not doing this right now, but you want to get to that. I have 40 head of cattle, I have 20 acres of ground. How do I, how do I get to where, okay. We're going into the, the calculation now. I mean, I didn't know, do you have to put them in a paddock and just feed them hay till you start getting your grass to grow? Or do you just, you, I will show you now when we go into the calculation. Can you wait just <laughs> yeah, literally, literally a few minutes? I hate giving 
a formula because all formulas eventually fail. Mm -hmm. But I've got to give you the formula to understand what I'm talking about here. Yes, sir. Sorry. So, you're moving the cows all done today. At night, you're going to take the cows and put them in the paddock. You can leave them in the same paddock. Yeah. They don't destroy that paddock being there longer periods of time? Well, they've only eaten 20% and they, yeah. every mouthful is so nutritious they can't eat any more grass, so they lie down. So they're not wandering around making it smell like cattle. There's <coughs> enough food in there to see them through and through <coughs> and particularly beef cattle. Okay. Sorry, I beg your pardon. Guys, we'll get to you. Yes, sir. Uh, is this the way to buy a pad in front of you? Yes. Right. Yes, sir. The recovery, the recovery period you're using right now is 30 days, but that's not a constant. That's something you'll adjust. We for your go conditions. into that, and we're going to investigate what you will do on your property to find the recovery period of the plants that you're working with. Yes, sir. Can you repeat the questions? I, I missed this question. I, I like the answer, but I didn't get the question. Sorry, I really broke up in the question. <laughs> Buying time. No. I think you know okay. your question. Yeah. I was asking where the cattle spent the night. Where did the cattle spend the night? Paddock. I would leave them in the same paddock because if you looked at the body language of those animals, they're not moving. They've filled up and they just plonk down, they lay down. So there's a lot of ground that hasn't had animals on it. It's only 20% has been grazed. And there's still plenty of food of energy, whatever you like to call it, to sustain those animals. But the interesting part is, I'm coming to you guys, the interesting part is this guy feeds no concentrates in the dairy. So when the price of milk, all the other dairy farmers <coughs> are losing half what they get paid, that's the money that they're losing and the price of milk still doesn't go up and dairy farmers are getting out of business. Not just in America, all over the world. But who cares? Sorry, we've bespoken to you. Yes, ma'am, another question. We'll come back to you if we need to. Where do you put the mineral feeder? If you're moving them this often, do you just put it where they are at night? No, this guy, we have moved the mineral feeder to just outside the dairy. The water, we no longer put water in the paddock. Cattle do not need water all day. They're not humans. We put the water at the dairy. The cows come out of the dairy, they drink water, they fill up with minerals and they go to the, the pasture. People don't spend money. Advertising, going to town, the money goes to town. They love you because you allow them to take your money. Just change it. Yes, ma'am. So you spoke about how they like, increased the volume, the amount that they were producing of milk. What about the milk fat? Did that change the milk fat content? That's another milk? story, but you can manage. What was the question? Sorry. How do you increase the butter fat in the milk? Or did the moving them, did that Did moving them increase the butter fat? Yes, it did, but not as much as I'd like. So immediately we go back to what do you need to supplement them with to get the butter fat up. And one of them is dry hay, if you so wish. If you don't want to, okay, you can give them apple cider vinegar. You can give them manufactured cool equivalent of apple cider vinegar, or whatever. But so just, the nat just doing this naturally increased it. Does increase okay. it, yeah. Sorry, yes sir. So yesterday when Isaac moved them into that in intense herd, all 300 cattle. When these 1,000 animals on the first move, was it that intense or was it more intense than that? Or more dense? No, well, these are very close together and it's the paddock. Remember, it's the same area for the day that he grazed, so you, if you can visualize it. I can't okay. put it out on a, on a slide. Right. Excuse me, sir, there are other people behind you. We have had a turn with you. Yes, sir. Two milkings, early morning, late in the afternoon. Two mornings, uh, two milkings a day. He he 
He does. Other people do different things, but he's doing two. Yes, sir. Is that Well, I don't know. I didn't get involved in that. I've got too many problems of my own. <laughs> he, uh, I think it was about 18 months when a youngster came on and took up the reins and did another head. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> I understand the example is with dairy cows. So, by the frequent maintenance of the rotation, it's going to be a Absolutely. Why are those cows not grazing? They are so full of energy and nutrition that the bacteria in the rumen has sent a message to the brain to, to stop the mouth bringing any more of that stuff in here. We've got no more room to breathe. So with, uh, apple cider vinegar, is the water also increased fat content for finishing the stew? Sorry, I can't hear you. Sorry. The apple cider vinegar Would the apple cider the increase the fat content on the beef stews? The apple cider vinegar will increase increase the performance of beef cattle, yes. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, other people did hear you, I didn't. I apologize. Yes, ma'am. So when you're talking about the density, is the main thing out of that density having more cattle not taking the And or and or I've got to try and tell you all the options and make get you to make the choice. That's all I'm doing. Okay. So if you want to make money and you want more cattle and you want to improve your grass, whatever, I've already given you the options. Okay. Yes, sir, ma'am. Yes, it would work with sheep, and it does improve animal performance in terms of keeping the pH closer to seven. We back at seven. Yes, one more. Okay, so you said that he moved them, and they had only consumed like twenty percent of the previous paddock. So I think about that, and I would say. That's all going to be so wasted. It's going to get out of hand behind me. I would make them want to stay longer. So what? What's wrong with my thinking? I'm not looking at the animal behavior. I mean, do I want to look at the animal behavior, or do I want to look at the forage that they've consumed versus what's left? Can we repeat that question again? Yeah, it's such a long question. I could never repeat it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, so, okay, we moved the cattle and you said they'd only consume 20% of what was in that paddock. In my mind, I would look at that paddock and say, they need to stay there longer. There's so much left behind that if I don't come back to it for 30 days, it's going to go to seed and I'll have lost it. So am I supposed to be looking at the animal behavior, which that says they don't want to really move either? Do I want to look at the grass that there's still so much forage in there and make them stay? Or do I want to move them because I've already said I'm going to move them 12 times today? So whichever which way, you've actually <laughs> created a problem for yourself. <laughs> because you have done such a good job that you've grown so much grass you don't know what to do with it. So when you keep them longer, if you keep them longer in front of you, you can go to see. If you go forward and graze this, this is also going to go to seed and then you're going to do a mosaic. You're not going to graze it all anyway. Then you have to buy a tractor and a bush rock to keep it down. So whatever. You've got the options. Get a youngster and give them another herd or plant another herd and come and graze it. That to me is the cheapest. That's why that's the option I gave him. That is the most sensible option and the cheapest option. Bring in more cattle. If you don't want to do it, Give somebody else the opportunity. And people, we need to pass this knowledge on because you guys are on the land, you are practicing, you know what you're doing, you learned about the property. Pass on that information to the next generation so that it can be kept in for agriculture. People in the institutions, the universities, never made a living out of livestock. They don't care what happened. They get a monthly check irrespective of what nature throws at them. They do not understand the implications. <coughs> and people are not blaming them. 
It's what's happened in society. <coughs> yes, sir, we've got back to you. You're welcome. Okay, on this business of staying overnight in the paddock, is the paddock, there are 12 moves. Is the paddock still the hole, or is it that last move? Open the hole. Let's repeat that question if we can. <coughs> so is the, is the paddock in section still in the night, or is it the whole paddock? And I'm saying it's the whole paddock because the fences come out of there because this is a center pivot and the center pivot's going to come in and irrigate the property the next day when the cattle have moved out there. <coughs> yes, sir. Sorry. Uh, no, that's okay. Uh, you said for the dairy cows, they have the mineral and the water at the, uh, you know, for the, where the milking happens, but for beef, if you're moving them that often, like let's say five times a day, six times a day, whatever, you'd have to move the water and mineral every time for the beef cattle? Or move, walk back five days. I love five days to walk back to the water. <coughs> the question was, these are dairy cows and they're going back to the dairy, they're getting mineral and water at the dairy. If you've got beef cattle, do you move it around with the beef? Well, make a plan, people. What's your quality of life? Do you want to keep moving minerals and water all day? No. So you make a plan with walking back and you can walk back. Greg only likes three days. I'm happy in Africa. <coughs> Remember our soil in Africa, we could use American soil as fertilizer on our soil. That's the difference in the soil. <coughs> There's a, an Amish fellow in Pennsylvania, and I don't know if Ian knew that this kid did this, this, but Ian was on this farm, I believe, and they were doing a workshop. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a berry, all grass berry, no supplement. And what he was doing, he, was moving, he bought bat patches, so he, the, the dairy cows were moved every hour, but he didn't give them any water until they got to one o'clock in the afternoon. So he grazed through his farm to the water tank, they got a drink, and then they grazed away from the water tank in the afternoon until it was milking time. So they got a drink when they came out of the parlor, but they also got a drink at noon. And he said his butter fat absolutely exploded. And it wasn't that much more labor because he just got in the morning and put in all the paddy, one water point, that was it. So he didn't have water in every paddy, and those cows didn't get any water for the first four moves until they got to noon or one o'clock. I thought that was really, we could do that with the cow. You could do that with the sheep. Put the water out and graze toward the water. They don't need water. They don't need water until they get to noon. And then when they get noon, they can get the water. So, yeah. Sorry, just hold. Why do we humans think that cattle and sheep need water all day? Because it's hot. Because we're there. Hot. <laughs> no, follow the money. Are we stupid or something? We don't drink all day, except we're starting to drink all day because we're getting like animals, that's all. <laughs> yeah, sorry. This, I, I want to get into this a little bit because my biggest limiting factor that I have to get started is my water infrastructure. I'm in West Texas, it's 119 degrees through a big chunk of the summer, and I'm nervous about having enough water and having them have access to water when they need it. Stop there. Are you a beef cow? Can we repeat yes. that? You're, he's in, folks, he's in West Texas, 119 degrees. He's concerned that his cows are going to get stressed if they don't get water. That's the basic question. Okay. So we go to Namibia. Eight to ten inches of rain a year. Right. The cattle drink water. They walk for a day to get to the grazing. They graze for a day. They walk back for a day and they drink water. Every third day, fourth day, they're drinking water. Why do you want water? You trained your cattle to do what they're doing. We have an animal called a hensbok in our country, an oryx. There's no grass, there's only sand, but they pick fat. What are they eating? There's no water, where do they drink? Who cares? They've adapted to what happens and you just form follows function, get the animals to adapt to what you can do, but start slowly and don't shock them. I mean, if you prevented me from drinking a beer in the evening, I'd be four hours. Sorry, 
I apologize. <laughs> Not a question, but more of a comment maybe is it's the the cattle are adapted. You gotta have the right type of cattle in that situation. You couldn't take a Montana black Angus cow and throw her in West Texas or Namibia. Right. right. She died. Like it's right. So you, you gotta have adapted cattle. That was a question right. or comment. Right. And that's absolutely. Many years ago when they had bad cold weather in Canada, many cattle died and the biggest mistake they made is they came down all the way to Texas and bought cattle and put them back in Canada. Had they kept that herd closed in Canada, they would have the best cattle you could imagine. But anyway, let's not get involved in Canada. We might be here in Missouri. Yes, sir. So we're, we're in Arizona and I'm wondering if there's a strategy to use irrigated pasture, especially probably because it grows, let's say, plant prone to irrigation, and the, it appears that the density or the nutrient density is not as high as the density in stress plants that's not irrigated. But I'm wondering if you can leg, if there's a strategy for, for, for legging from an irrigated pasture into improving the pastures that are not irrigated. The gentleman is asking irrigated pastures from Arizona. Is it worthwhile and feasible to irrigate to get more establishment and more grasses to fix the soil? You can do it, but it's going to cost somebody a huge amount of money. Mm -hmm. And this is the problem when you start working with corporations and municipalities. It's somebody else's money, it mm -hmm. doesn't matter. All that I've spoken about is your money and it will hurt you if you spend it and spend it incorrectly. And this is what's happening all over the world. It's easy to spend other people's money. But are you going to get the result that you're actually wanting? And that is where you guys have got to do your homework and make sure that it's given the return on the investment. And having done all these things myself, I'm telling you it won't work. But it's up to you. The apple cider vinegar, you're putting that in the water, correct? No, I don't use apple cider vinegar. You must remember our <laughs> price of our cattle in our country are a fraction of yours. Okay? The inputs are probably double yours in terms of cost per pound, per kg. So we just don't do it. We can't feed apple cider vinegar. It's even too expensive to give to humans, let alone cattle. We, we tried it last, uh, it was last year, um, was it two years, yeah, it was two years ago. And it, it, it's a sub, I mean, it's, it's an input, it's a cause. Um, the way we got consumption is the cattle eat the heck, and they'll, they'll drink it like water if you put it in a, in a bin. So we put sea salt. We put sea salt in it to limit them, so they couldn't drink as much. So we put five gallons of apple cider to, um, it's five gallons of apple cider to a 50 pound bag of sea salt, spread out to a bin. And it was gone every day. Those cattle would just take that vinegar, they took it right down. But I, you know, I'm from Missouri, it's a show me state. I didn't see any benefit of it, and it's a thousand dollars for one 250 gallon coat. Thousand bucks. I didn't get my thousand bucks back. I didn't feel like it. So I've still got a little bit of it down if you want. So I still have to, I'll tell you. So, what were you trying to solve? I was trying to solve uh, why and um, getting better breed back, um, getting slicker hair, because better animal performance. So, you're trying to raise the pH of the body yes. of the animal. Based on Steve <laughs> Campbell's workshop, he went to. And he sells apple cider vinegar. And I'm not knocking Steve Campbell, he's a sharp guy. But what he recommended, we tried, we could not get it to work. And I think it's because our South Pole is superior. Has either of you seen any places where they have uh, attempted to make a vinegar out of something else on site? I mean, the process of making vinegar is really not that complicated. 
I mean, why apple cider vinegar? I mean, yeah, I haven't been involved in any of that. I, don't I, know. I just wondered, y'all seen way more stuff than we do. I haven't heard of anybody doing that. Yeah. All right. Any more? Guys, uh, any supplementation? Any supplementation should be viewed as a crutch. When you are healed after an accident, you don't continually use crutches when you are healed unless you have got bragging rights. Why use a crutch? A crutch is to be used when you are injured and you are going through a transition period and learning. That's the only time you use supplementation. Yes, sir. So y'all both are in agreement about the mineral heater, and you're seeing benefits out of that. Yes. Yeah. The mineral, the mineral feeder. I got on Bader's program in 2008, and luckily I did it in the summertime. Don't get on a free choice enterprise mineral program in the wintertime. They'll eat you out of house and home. But what Ian taught me was the better job that I did at grazing moving them more frequently, not pushing them too hard, the cattle actually backed off the mineral because they were getting enough mineral. But what we're finding out is if we go to a new farm that we lease, the cattle eat us out. They'll, they'll eat all the mineral out of the tub because there's no mineralization in the grass. And so Mark Bader was always giving me crap when he was alive. He said, Greg, you need to go lease another farm. He wanted to sell me more mineral because the cows would consume it. But on the Judy farm, we moved the mineral from the Judy farm. Sometimes they won't even touch it. They don't touch it because that, that soil is healed. Yes, sir. Have you found they eat all the mineral of all the 20 different varieties? On a new farm, on a new farm, yeah, sometimes they'll just clean the box out. I get like four or five and that's it. Well, you got good soil. You're in Nebraska. That's corn country. You got topsoil there. We don't have any topsoil here. You topsoil the foot deep. Or more. That makes a big difference. The depth of your topsoil makes a big difference. You on the back. Yes. How much uh, how much does it cost to get started on free? It's course? expensive. It is, it's expensive. Yeah, yeah it's about twenty five hundred to get started just to fill your mineral field. <coughs> it comes in twenty five pound twenty five pound totes. Um, we're down about sixty percent from what we started. Sixty percent. Yeah, when we first started, it was pricey. Um, if you have an animal consuming too much, Ian has a different way of dealing with it than I do. We mix salt with it. So we'll mix it 50-50. And the one mineral they really tear up is phosphorus. Mm -hmm. And phosphorus is the most expensive out of all of them. So we're cutting at 50% with sea salt. That knocks it back big time. That, but Ian says, I've heard him say this, and he may correct me, he may change his tune in five years, but he used to say, you set a budget for your mineral, and when it's done, they don't get any more mineral. Are you still think that in? Correct. So you doing your financials, you sound prepared to spend so much, and when that is up, but remember what Greg said, you feed in the summer, and you rather not feed in the winter if you're going to withdraw it. But remember, you will be feeding it for longer if you take it away. The longer and the more consistent you feed it, the quicker your animals fix the soil and you don't consume as much. So you, in actual fact, Mark Bader put it in the words, I'm doing myself out of business by feeding three quarters per month. Don't let your salt box get empty. Every time. There's a salt compartment. Never let that thing get in. Keep it rounded off. If it goes empty, there's a little bit of salt in some of that. They're going to go after it. And they're just going, they're going for the salt. But they're eating their you know, $25 a bag mineral. Don't let that happen. Always keep that mineral, that salt box full. There's three, I'm gonna get down and back and I'll come back to you. Yes. So with, with regards to the phosphorus, because it is the most expensive, what percent would you say is passing through the cattle and going back onto the land? Well, according to Bader, about 70 to 80% of the mineral ends up back on the land. Okay. Yeah. Uh, next to you, Dr. and I'm gonna come to you. Yes. The, uh, did, uh, last year when you were doing the uh, apple cider vinegar and, and salt and, and uh, Redmond's conditioner, you said that it had really um, reduced the amount of 
free choice that you were that they were consuming. So that got me to start started on changing my mineral program. So I, what I've done is I keep a free choice, uh, or I mean, I'm, it's always acceptable, accessible salt, and I'm using about a quarter of the mineral that I was, and I'm not seeing any condition loss, and the symptoms, I don't have problems like that, like, you know, if, if, I, if I forget to move, if I move my cows and don't get right up on moving my salt with them, I start having issues within a week. Yeah. And um, so I was just wondering if you thought, I feed an enticer with it. Well, if you're getting good animal performance and you're, they're losing, you're only using about 25% of what you were using, don't change a thing. Keep doing what you're doing. Yes, sir. I've got, I've got exotic sheep in breeding pens right now, and I went to the Free Choice Mineral. And I'm terrified because they're wailing on the copper. Yeah, that, that, that makes me nervous. It's not an issue. Did y'all hear that? On Free Choice Enterprises, not want to say it's not. It has never been an issue with our sheep. There's a mineral compartment for copper for sheep. If you feed a cattle mineral, it's got copper in it. It's got way too much copper in there for sheep. But if you give them a choice, sheep will not overeat on copper and kill themselves. Mm -hmm. They need a little copper to help knock out the parasites, so don't don't fret about it. That's on hair sheep. Woolies, I don't know about that. I've heard that wool sheep are not as uh, adapted to copper as hair sheep are. I don't know. There's, that's what I've heard. There's a hand in the back. Yes, sir. Uh, on the salt, uh, the salt block from fraction fly okay, or do you need it loose? No, it's loose. Don't feed a lot. You don't get enough consumption. And, They'll sit there and lick on that thing and lick on it and lick on it. They should be after grazing. Let them come up and get a lick. Folks, there's a place in Kansas, uh, they call it Kansas uh, Sea Salt. It's from the ocean when it covered Kansas, whatever, how many years ago that was. That's the old sea salt. That's the good stuff. The sea salt out of the ocean today is polluted. You don't want to be feeding that. It's called Kansas Sea Salt. And uh, you can get, we buy it by the pallet. It's pretty, it's the cheapest thing we feed our cat. It's only like, well, it's probably went up to the bottom. But the last bought, it was like five bucks a bag for 50 pounds. Yeah. And they like it. It's got like 70 some different sea minerals, sea minerals in it. And it's a lot cheaper than C90. C90, they'll eat the heck out of it. And they're not saying C90 is bad, but it's pricey. It's a pretty darn pricey stock. Yes, sir. Ian, since you brought up the lanes, work. Can you use teas and extracts with the protozoa and the fungus and bacteria to unlock the parent material as an alternative to free choice? You know, the, do I feed anything else to break down the bacteria in the rumen? Uh, no, to use the lanes, extracts, and teas on the soil as an accelerator to break down the parent material that's locked in there as an alternative to free choice. No. We've got plenty, and nature has plenty of bacteria and fungi out there to deal with that. The minute you start bringing in bacteria and fungi from the Middle East or Far East. No, 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 this is on site. Like on locally site. grown no, I don't bacteria. Do and, okay. I don't do any of that. No. I, I think one of the problems uh, with putting a huge banking system on compost tea and extracts in a desert situation, if you spray that stuff out on the land, where's it going to find a home with that? Too dry. It's just going to get burned up. Too dry. It's too dry. You need a root. Um, we did a whole summer with me laying in here. Uh, all these different trials, compost tea, compost tea, compost, all these different levels. Heck, we put uh, humic acid in it. We put everything to make it really take off and grow. And we made sure it was not anaerobic. We had a microscope. We were checking it. And we did all these trials that we were playing, folks. And I spent a lot of time and a lot of money. And we made sure we sprayed it in green. So we were spraying it on ground that was wet. So we didn't kill our microbes. And we saw this. I saw zero results. 
I will back that up. Same in uh, country. Didn't work. Folks, be careful. You can spend a heck of a lot of money and time out there. And he is the whole time. He's over here beating me on the head. Use your cattle. Use your cattle. Use your cattle. <laughs> no. No, I'm going to heal the world. He's embarrassed by him making too much money. He wants to spend it. <laughs> <laughs> guys, he's like the rest of you. You all, you laugh at him. You laugh at yourselves. Because this is what you're encouraging. You want to send the money to town. <laughs> Whatever. I don't care. I was, I was intrigued. I was intrigued with the compost tea. I'll be honest with you. I went to the five-day workshop. I took the microscope classes. Here's what I came away with. If we can take a pile of compost, good compost, and run it through uh, compost tea and make it correctly, you can impact such a large area with a little bit of product and put yourself light years ahead. It all sounds great, but it didn't work. In the real world, it didn't work. Now, I'm not saying anything in Lane and teach it doesn't work. I'm just saying it didn't work here. So do a small trial. Don't go out and do it like I did. We did a large area over here. We spent all summer. Matter of fact, Kevin was part of that. It's Kevin in the tent. My intern, well, the guy that makes the bat like Kevin. Kevin was our intern that summer. We laid out all strips. We marked them. We had every strip marked. And Elaine was the one that did the soil test when we got done. And even she had said, well, Greg, I don't see any difference. No. I went in the same course that Greg is talking about. He, he I here. had taken my eye off the ball, and I bought a microscope. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody wants a microscope, I've got one at half price, people. <laughs> Who's bidding? I've got one I'll sell you, too. <laughs> I've got the best compost tea brewer in the world. Well, I didn't go that far. I just <laughs> went back. My wife was on me to get rid of it. It's in our shop, so I've got it for sale. If you want it. It's, it's called a white tea lippin. It's, it's <laughs> unbelievable. It's the best one made. It's made by, um, yeah, it's the best one made. Is this an option? Is this an option? Do you want to buy it? No. Oh. I was just... You put your hand up, you bought it. <laughs> Full price. <laughs> yes, what's your uh, My question, I don't have a question. I was going to say, uh, I came from a landscape background, and I found that you don't really need to buy compost tea. If you build it, they will come. I don't know how, but if you start with dead soil, like what I have in my area, Southern California, you build your soil up the way maybe the, you guys are talking about yeah. over a few years time the earthworms just show up and that's really what you're talking about are earthworm castings that's your tea yep. right there that's right they're the best animals we have on our farm yes yes sir um so far like the biggest thing i've taken away from all of this is that um simplicity is going to take us the furthest way along um can you guys just sort of elaborate a little bit more on the idea of just like he keeps telling you, let the animals do the work. Um, <laughs> how do we get out of our own way to sort of keep that focus in mind? Like, what, what has been your strategy to kind of, or have you just kind of bumped your head against the wall over and over and you just kind of well, keep coming back? Well, it helps when you start out poor and you don't have any money to spend. <laughs> uh, that's the way we were. I mean, I was down to $10. That's all I had in my check-in account was $10. And so I was in a point where I didn't have any money to spend, so I had to figure out better ways to, to make a living on the property. And I think one of the biggest curses that you can have is for your parents or your father-in-law or somebody to leave you a large sum of money. And you just go through it. It's called fun money. But if you have to work for it and, and accumulate and do without, you're not going to be... You look for more simple ways. And I'm glad I met Ian. You know, I didn't go out to to search this guy out. I just found him accidentally, but he said, before you spend any money, I'm going to steal one of your quotes. He said, before you steal it, before you steal it, before you spend any money, ask yourself, what would happen is, in this situation before a white man arrived with a firearm? And folks, I've said that question to myself 10,000 times. It's a really good quote. Remember that. 
Y'all should write that one down if you can't remember it. Repeat it. In this situation, so you, you get yourself up against a rock in a hard place. You're like, you know, I really need to go buy that new tractor, right? or I need to go buy this new supplement, or I need to go buy this super, super something. Ask yourself, how would this situation rectify itself before a white man arrived with a firearm? And then he'll go a step further. Wait 24 hours, go sit in the shade of a tree and have a cold drink, and, and brainstorm a way to go around it. Maybe not spend that. There's a better way of doing it. Ian, do you elaborate on what I said? Yes. We had problems. We got a group of people doing plastic management, and we formed those groups of 12 people. And they were having a difficulty distinguishing between a want and a need. So in that part of the world, if we've got to go and fix a fence, they get on a tractor and they drive around the property. And they fix the fence and they come back. And fixing that fence has just cost you a fortune. So in the group, most people took the back tire off a tractor. So they couldn't use the tractor. Because by the time they put the tire on, and started it, they were so tired they wouldn't want to fix the fence. So they walked and fixed the fence. You see what I'm telling you? You don't need most of what you, what you buy. And Greg was saying, sit under a, bit, a tree with a cool drink. A beer does work better. <laughs> I was going to say that, but it doesn't. Are we going to break for... Yeah. Um, let's go ahead and uh, take a break, get up and walk, slip the legs, move back down here in a little bit.